Welcome to the Tokens session. For the next couple of hours, we will explore the significance and multiple, at times contradictory, implications of tokens based systems for governance, using 1948 as a symbolic prism. As the ensuing contributions are to make evident, the role of tokenization in governance cannot be divorced from its historical roots in the modernist and also imperial projects of standardization, the abstracting tendencies of technological and financial evolution, as well as the intentional and accidental orders that are emerging in the interaction between these multiple dimensions. In part, charting a nonlinear, evolutionary process, in part, partaking in speculative projections. Our hope is to make explicit the techno social constitution of societies. How the circulatory dynamics of token space systems have an immense power to fold in the most divergent and, at first sight, incommensurable entities, yet equally produce ever novel possibilities for reordering both the logistics and logics of governance. To this extent, the session moves through a series of exchange blocks, genealogies of standardization, processing sovereignty, logics of derivation, and post-Westphalian interfaces, that are simultaneously mediated, and transactionally inscribed, into a blockchain-like architecture. Each speaker contribution, generates concept tokens. While the block visualization panel, diagrams transactions between them, and signs them into an irreversible block. In this setup, semiotic production is cross-integrated, with techno-financial mediation, once again emphasizing, how tokens-based systems, lead us to operate, from the position of techno-social enmeshment, between meaning-making, and structure-making. For the final exchange, an incomplete block, post-Westphalian interfaces, we borrow a concept from computational terminology, a hard fork, a radical change to the protocol, that makes previously invalid blocks, or transactions, valid or vice versa. We invite you, to become active stakeholders, in the discussion, with the contributors, on how to appropriate, and re-strategize, some of the processes, and dynamics, discussed in this session, in the name of reworking our shared foundations of governance. This short demo is designed to help you familiarize yourself with the concept token dashboard. Let's take a look at its functions. The left hand screen captures the key information pertaining to the generation of concept tokens through discursive contributions, taking place on stage. At the very top, you will find a feed of concept tokens as they are being generated. Just below, you will find information on the identities of concept token transacting peers within each exchange cluster, with the name appearing in bold when speech and concept token generation are in active mode. Just below you will find a list of operators, underwriting the transactions between concept tokens, and consequent block formation. The concept token pool scale window keeps a record of the total number of concept tokens generated at any point of the event. Meanwhile, peer density refers to the total available number of peer nodes in the system, including audience and contributors. Block processing status is a running narrative feed detailing various processes relevant to concept token generation, valuation, transaction validation, circulation, inscription into a block, and systemic implications. On the right side of this screen, you will find concept token event modifiers and concept token market capitalization windows. The first, offers selective insights into specific events that have had a defining effect on the concept token and its valuation. The latter, is a reference to the fiat value of concept tokens across, or the value of their redeemability in fiat currency. The middle screen provides some additional functions. 
regional orientation window shows directly or tangentially referenced localities. Search correlation valuation window registers the Google search ecology of a specific concept token. While the attention ecology valuation focuses on its Twitter ecology, both of which impact a concept token's valuation. Blocks completed and blocks in progress windows offer additional information on the current status of the event, whereas irreversible transaction consequence window details the implication of the latest block formation. Transaction block processing status references the block visualization panel on the right-hand screen, which diagrams transactions between concept tokens and their signing into a block. Systemic overview windows offer comparative metrics such as scalability, measured by maximum number of transactions per second, and energy inefficiency, measured by the amount of kilowatts necessary to fuel a certain operation. Finally, relational evolution of tokenization window tracks the temporal dimension of the event in percentage terms until completion. Peers may now enter the network. Tokens are everywhere. They run through the fabric of everyday life. They are recognizable by man and machine alike. But in 1948, tokens wouldn't have looked like this, but more like this. These are examples from the field that is technically called paranumismatics. And this field is not about money or legal tender, but it is about tokens. So that's the de definition of this. These tokens have one thing in common, and that is that they're not issued by a legal state or um, a nation. They can store all different kinds of properties, um, not only monetary value. And just to give you a few examples, you can um, have guerrilla monies that are there before the state really occurs, as here in Cuba. Or you can have tokens that measure differently, that measure the hours you have worked. You have cooperative money. For example, it measures and stores how much um, you can, um, how much it stores the parts of the profit the cooperative makes from you and redeems what you have given to it. And, of course, there are more sinister forms. Uh, plantation monies, for example. You get your wage in one of those tokens, but the value is not redeemable except in the shops that the plantation runs itself. So this is a really strong um, direction of buying power. Some of the tokens are, of course, less visible. And I will be looking at the formation of three of those, um, at the formation of three international units on procedures of standardization involved in this and at a genealogy of international tokenization. As always with genealogies, this is just one path through the whole field. You could have chosen many others. But I wanted to contribute to this discussion on autonom autonomous systems of the technosphere that we shouldn't probably reify technology and that tokens are formed in international agreements at one place. Um, there is treaty making. Tokens have a legal side to them. And um, sub for this, I will visit three international conventions which such tokens um, were at which such tokens were at stake, and one is um, the 1851 metric currency. Another token I want to talk about is the UNRWA unit, and for me, it's the most important unit of the 1940s. I will explain why. Um, and in 1944, I will uh, briefly dwell on the banker. Sadly, though. Um, my tokens have failed, and <laughs> none of those tokens is with us today. Um, 
Wandering through Richard Paxton's Crystal Palace, visitors could marvel at the world of exotisms presented to them. And at the 1851 International Exposition in London, some might have ju done just that. Others, though, other visitors may have noticed how difficult it was to gorge the technology on display. What was the measure of these machines? Their impact, their capacity, their volume. Subsequently, all exhibitors were requested to translate the specifics of their product in terms of the metric system. In parallel, we see the formation of an international association and the publication of a declaration of opinion for obtaining a uniform decimal system of weights, measures, and coins. And that's the point I wanted to make. The metric system had the tendency to extend to monetary units at that time it seemed natural. The association heralded itself as having made a remarkable uh, progress for the history of civilization. It was a happy movement which brings all nations together in the path of their industry. So I guess there are two forces at play here. Firstly, we can see that the language of standardization gains momentum in a technocratic industrial context. I can only echo um, the historian of law, Milos Vetch, in this point. He has described technical norms as a veritable new chapter of rulemaking. Standards did not emerge in the traditional way, so there weren't politicians or executive representatives involved, uh, no diplomats. Instead, industrial nego negotiations took on an internationalist side. Norms were organized by corporations and especially by engineers. Standardization even paved the way for other international treaty making and um, it is epitomized by the 1857 Meter Convention. Another force forging this metric currency is secondly um, a universal language that is employed. And I want to add this with Lucy Dresel, who as a Jew um, managed to get a PhD from the Kaiser Wilhelm University, but did not get to live until 18, uh, 1948. In her, history of world monet, in her history of world money, Mirabeau, Prieur de la Côte d'Or, and Talleyrand take center stage. For them, combining this currency with a metric system would invent a monnaie, monnaie commune, a unit based on the natural and universal standard. These tokens would be grounded in nature, such as to be available for every nation on Earth. And the specifically occidental language of quantification is what I wanted to stress here, because um, I think in the next talk we will be hearing more about the narrowness of this universalism. But still, um, it is an important building block, I guess, of this token. The technocratic personnel and the industry itself take over the process of norm setting. That's important. And this procedure may be somewhat blurred by this language borrowed from the French Revolution. When we come to the 1940s, um, we see an increased occurrence of international conventions that can be observed in minor towns around Washington, D.C. Here you see um, a hot springs conference on food and agriculture. The international is rather congru congruent with allied forces at this time. In fact, many meetings are attended by 44 nations at the time. It, this would, of course, include Russia and China, but, of course, exclude Germany and Japan. Radically changing um, is, of course, this mixture of nations um, after 1948. And discussions in these conventions focus on two destabilizing factors. They focus on bread prices and exchange rates. Both problems involve new tokens or making of international units, as I want to show. And just for um, reminding everybody that the people attending these conferences would have had ample experience of the hyperinflation of the 1920s, the Great Depression, um, of the New Deal, 
of um, every country's own fate with a gold standard and so on. So it was a time uh, where all the nations had broken off the gold standard, but um, interventionist policies were very much um, the order of the day. And here we could go um, into further detail with Lionel Robbins and the Commod program, or the founding of the food and agricultural organization that built statistics and was organizing seeds, as we have seen yesterday. Um, but I will focus on two other, uh, as I was mentioning, on two other units, the UNRWA um, unit. And I apologize for this uh, picture, but you will see in the next slide where I had to choose it, the United, um, this, this setup of this conference is really standardized, and sometimes I have the impression that it just carried the flags to the next hotel, but um, you will see about that. The convention resulted in the UNRWA unit. This unit was decided upon by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, which was founded in um, 1943. The declared aim was to take over and assist people after the military had left, to plan, coordinate, administer, or arrange for the administration of measures for the relief of victims of war in any area under the control of any of the United Nations through the provision of food, fuel, clothing, shelter, and other basic necessities, medical, and other essential services. So we see what is really at stake here is the bare necessities, the basic needs. It's about vital, um, goods. Some say the UNRWA produced prisoners of peace, but initially they assisted people left stranded in Poland, France, Lithuania, from Latvia, Yugoslavia, Russia, the Ukraine. Many of them should be repatriated, and uh, that was only part of it, so corn might be shipped from Argentina to, to China, and livestock could be distributed. It was a worldwide operation. For this UNRWA used the UNRWA unit, and what you have to do if you want to distribute um, vital goods, you need a bureaucracy. <laughs> and um, here you see like, that, that they started printing all these empty sheets, and it's important to note that the token, the UNRWA token, is always personalized, and that's probably the most futuristic about it, that these kind of tokens did not only have uh, a material value, so some good that you could get for them, but that they were um, identity cards at the same time. Of course, you have to develop a classification for people. How does a normal person rank in comparison to a refugee, a mentally challenged person, or a policeman who gets the best in this example? In 1943, when you get to the material, um, where do you get the material to distribute? Many donor countries were involved, but this chart, of course, is again from the US, how to collect uh, clothes, preferably from the people who weren't returning from the war. How could you get these uh, channeled through the UNRWA into the uh, world as we see it here? Of course, in the end, you have to distribute. Um, it looks a bit less sophisticated. Um, it's a photo, back of the photo reads, discharging UNRWA corn by the bucket method, and it's uh, situated in the south of Poland. But if you say now that this UNRWA unit is probably not very powerful, um, I just remind you that in this time, it was just the in international way of a national standard that rationing tokens um, were used in, in all the war economies to distribute the basic needs and um, up to 70% or 60% of the commodities would just be transferred by this redistributive tokens. Um, another example from France. Um, so the 1940s, the late 1940s, were very much token-based. Um, and I think that this international UNRWA unit is probably my, my token of tokens for the time. And this is important when we come to the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference um, in the sense that it was about stabilizing exchange rates, but it was at the same time preventing uh, wars and hunger had to happen again. Here at the opening ceremony where Henry Morgenthau addresses the representatives from 44 nations in the mountains of New Hampshire. All in all, there were 730 participants 
assisted by well-briefed American staff, with Boy Scouts volunteering to carry the few available microphones. Wall Street banks were successfully outmaneuvered. Henry Morgenthau, VR Secretary of Treasury, apparently wanted the unit to be called Mondor. He notes, though, that Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted it to be called a trade dollar or demos, or indeed a victor. The US, in the end, won uh, the conference, as, it, as we know, but apparently the general architects of the monetary conference were other personalities. Left, you see, um, the not very well-known Harry Dexter White. He advocated a token called Unitas, but it was, in fact, more another name for the dollar, and the dollar became the new leading currency of the world. White had drafted it, bef before that, White had drafted ideas about Pan-American banks and had a lot um, of contact with these banks. And this is what Eric Hellena tells us, that we shouldn't just see this uh, Bretton Woods conference as a kind of dollar sterling diplomacy, but that we should acknowledge um, the especially huge impact from Latin America. But again, uh, we may hear more about that from our next speaker. Um, Harry Dexter White, again, did not see the, uh, get to live until 1949. He was debunked by the CIA as a Russian spy and um, died of a heart attack. The other key figure of the conference, the British representative John Maynard Keynes, this sheds some light on the relevance of tokens at stake. The reason for the international convention was the predicted sums needed or are necessary to rebuild the war-torn uh, countries, and the banker or unitas would be used each time a country needed credit. But what was so special about the banker? So the banker was a supranational fiat reserve currency. No person or company would have touched it, only sovereign states. It was a fiat currency backed against nothing. And, of course, we know that Great Britain just had lost all of its gold reserves to the United States. So the bunker uh, was a fiat currency artificial unit for nations to keep their books about their debts, their imports, and their exports balanced. The aim would have been to possess the zero bunker. If you had too much or too little, you would have been financially disciplined by this clearing union that they wanted to set up, and each national currency would have been tied with some elasticity to the banker. The banker itself would be the anchor of it all, so to re-establish some stability that was still flexible enough to um, react to, to cycles of um, the, the national economies. But we know um, that this clearing union didn't happen, and I just want to briefly sketch that there's, of course, much more economic fantasy behind this. Um, there is a genealogy of the League of Nations that goes um, through the International Valuta Association that was promoted by the League of Nations. Or you have Friedrich Ernst St um, Schumacher, who was uh, inventing a clearing union as well. Most interestingly, though, um, there were plans to back money not only against gold, but against grain. It was um, suggested by Graham that some kind of B-materialism could happen, um, not silver and gold, but commodities as um, a backup that would have been very nice for, uh, of course, for nations that had these materials, but not um, metal enough. So what was really lost with the banker? When Keynes returned, um, and he addressed the House of Lords back in England, he found a rather biblical simile. Your lordships will remember how little any of us liked the names proposed. Banker, Unitas, Dolphin, Besant, Derek, and heaven knows what. Some of your lordships were good enough to join in the search for something better. I, and this is still Keynes speaking, I recall a story of a country parish in the last century where they were accustomed to giving their, names biblical, uh, giving their children biblical names as Amos, Ezekiel, Obdiah, and so forth. Needing a name for a dog, after a long and vain search of the scriptures, 
They called their dog Moreover. We hit on no such happy solution, with the result that it has been the dog that died. And it might have dawned on some of the lords that the British Empire was really at stake here. So thanks a lot. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Erstmal herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Es ist eine Ehre für mich, hier zu sein im Haus der Weltkulturen, ein Platz der Zusammenkunft, ein Platz der Begegnung, ein Platz des Dialog. And that's the stent of my German. <laughs> so, uh, before I continue embarrassing myself, let me go back to English and uh, tell you that, uh, or rather invite you to think about this little proposal, that someone should write a small book of philosophers' dreams. Uh, I believe the history of our aspiration to justice must be told from an entirely new perspective, and I want to propose today one such perspective may come from the dreams reported by those who have done the best to analyze and theorize the ways we relate to each other and to objects, pass judgment, value, mourn, or let go, which are characteristic of our existential condition as humans. Uh, you might know, of course, that in ancient Greece, Socrates tells us that the choice between poetry and philosophy as mediums for engaging in the pursuit of truth and the practice of truth-saying in public speech came to him in a dream. Meanwhile, in China, Shuangzi dreamed he was a butterfly. Upon waking up, he was famously unable to determine whether Shuangzi had just dreamt he was a butterfly or a butterfly still dreaming of being Shuangzi. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas considered the prophetic, future divining qualities of dreams. And we're all familiar with Descartes' dream argument in Meditations 1. We might not know, though, that he was beaten by 500 years when in his deliverance from error, Al-Ghazali delivered the first sustained argument from the existence of dreaming to the groundlessness of our waking life certainties. Now, I believe Al-Ghazali may have been, in fact, the inventor of our modern notion of risk. But a favorite of mine is Baruch Spinoza's dream, reported on 20 July 1664 in a letter that he wrote to his friend Pieter Baling. Uh, Baling was a merchant engaged in trade with the Iberian Americas. In the dream, the vivid image of a wretched black Brazilian haunts Spinoza's sleep. Aside from the muted homoeroticism of the dream, I believe this may be the first register of the meaning of tokens in modern Western culture. In the context of the coloniality of the encounter between Europeans, Africans, and Amerindians in the Americas. The image of the black Brazilian disappeared, Spinoza tells us, when, and I quote him, as a diversion, I fix my eyes on a book or something else. But as soon as I turn my eyes away from such an object while looking at nothing in particular, the same image of the same Ethiopian kept appearing with the same vividness again and again and again. That's Spinoza. Now we know who the black Brazilian is, a slave, no less. But since this is a dream, and in the absurd logic of dreams, something may always stand for something else, we can also say that the mangy Brazilian, the individual in question, is here merely a token of given types. If this is the case, then the relation between the individual reported in the dream and the unifying framework of normalization and standardization that makes his black body disappear and reappear as a token 
is one of subsumption. This is confirmed by the operation of the book in the dream, arguably a symbol for universal, unifying, and standard knowledge that literally subsumes, absorbs, or makes the image and the body of the Brazilian slave disappear and then reappear again and again as something else, a substitute object or token. Crucially for our purposes here, this is the kind of relation that Theodore W. Adorno termed identity thinking, which he presented as the rational and mythic core of thought and practice. For him, rationalization means the comprehension of or meaning of individuals is increasingly had through their location within conceptual schemes whose fundamental terms are invariant and unchanging. As can be seen, what Adorno calls identity thinking is precisely what we term a standardization. Basically, a standardization means the subsumption, inclusion, or absorption of something, for instance, a voice, a body, or a communal practice in something else. More precisely, a conceptual, visual, or normative and normalizing a scheme, the terms of which are fundamentally invariant. This something else that is fundamentally invariant comes to stand for, both in the place of and as the place for what has been absorbed, the silenced voice, the missing body, or the devalued practice. A most powerful example of this logic of subsumption or absorption as substitution that for Adorno is the core, at the same time rational and mythical of thought and political practice, is the historical silencing of the voice of women. Its expropriation and reappropriation as an objectified set of standards ready to hand, or rather to voice, to mouth, in the rhetorical toolbox of public speech, labeled as inherently male. In her brilliant book, Women and Power, classical historian Mary Beard narrates how it came to happen that the voices and bodies of women were trampled upon and taken over from antiquity onwards by men, so that they, the latter, could effectively brand the space and the rules of public speech, from politics to law and the post-war discourse of human rights as their own. Add to this brief genealogy the accounts of anthropologists according to which women had been exchanged among traditional groups in accordance to the law prohibiting incest so as to arrange marriage alliances and foundational treaties between groups to form societies. And what you get is the critical suggestion that the trampled, violated, decapitated and silenced bodies of women were used, have been used as tokens from the very outset. This is the original universal money. The accounts of anthropologists proved contentious on this very aspect, in that the right rationalizations of the meaning of myths concerning the genealogy of law in the standard prohibition of incest seem to hide at its core and cover over the cruelty and quantity of the violence that must have occurred for the voices of women to be silenced and their bodies vanquished so that those same bodies and ways of speaking could be turned into tokens of themselves, but this time branded by men as theirs and theirs alone, actually demarcating the space of public speech, politics and law as exclusively patriarchal. Now think about the disappearing body of the mangy black Brazilian in Espinosa's dream in a similar way, and you get a very good idea of what coloniality and its accompanying civilization narrative condensed in the concept of sovereignty has meant historically. The imposition of white patriarchal rule in history and to history as something inherent, seemingly natural as the gold standard. For me, this means we must posit once more the question concerning the object as substitute or token of the vanquished body, of objects gathered where a meeting of speaking voices or actual bodies could have been, now carved up or displaced and mined by something else or someone else to accumulate their value for plunder. It means asking again, where did these bodies go? The bodies of the disappeared, 
the voices of the silenced women subject to oblivion, the peoples obliterated by the promise of civilization. Weren't they part of a record that would serve as the basis of a case of law and reparation? Coming as I do from Colombia in Latin America, a country where the apotheosis of war has taken place for over 60 years and in which a woman is killed every other day, I know these questions hailing from the distant classical past are very much a matter of the present and the future. I'm also reminded by the very anthropologists who travel far to seek the genealogy of laws, standards, and obligations in the prohibition of incest and their Amerindian interlocutors that the dreaming question may have been there, hidden in plain sight as a collective fantasy for as long as we founded our societies of inclusively exclusive laws and public speech conventions. Mankind's, and notice I said mankind's, not humankind's, mystified dream of, and I quote one anthropologist, seizing and fixing the fleeting moment when it was permissible to believe that the law of exchange could be evaded, that one could gain without losing, enjoy without sharing, in which all social forms of value and reproduction, which by definition are not containable within the self or the group, and thus must come from elsewhere, are displaced and deferred to the unattainable past or future of a world in which one might keep to oneself and keep for oneself all the women, all the money. Many of the anthropologists' interlocutors were women whose silenced bodies and abnormalized sexual practices become predominant once you begin to look for them, hidden in the record of travel writing between Europe and the Americas from the 16th century onwards. It is here that the genealogy of a standardization must begin in earnest. It teaches us at least two lessons. First, that the logic of subsumption as substitution is at the heart not only of the dream conjuring the image of a black Brazilian body, the sex of Amerindian women, the voice of Penelope told, telling, uh, uh, told to shut up by Telemachus, or the vanquished body of Medusa, decapitated and trampled, I almost said Trump hold, by Perseus, that obscure precursor of Donald J. Trump's, of the Donald J. Trump's of today's world. It is rather the very promise of civilization and development. Second, as said before, we must pay closer attention to the object. Let me repeat. Second, as said before, we must pay closer attention to the object or the fetish, if you prefer, a substitute and token for the vanquished body, for the trampled body. For the logic of substitution is also the logic of value in our modern societies concerned solely with expropriation, displacement, and accumulation of voices and bodies. The mining of data. That should be your focus. The silenced body, voices, the missing bodies, the missing peoples individualized and turned into tokens of invariant types, neither nation nor sovereignty. Isn't that precisely, and let us call that image onto the stage, what Eugene Delacroix was getting at when he depicted the death of Southern Apollos? It is difficult not to notice that what the painting portrays is exactly not the moment of Southern Apollos' death the fabled sovereign of the Persians, but that of the women around him and his horse, whose bodies became and become in the painting derivative, mere tokens of given types, as Adorno said. This is in keeping with the ancient tradition according to which to avoid sacrificing the king, to substitute him for one of his generals, and to avoid punishing the latter, you have him killing his horse, the horse-killing ritual at the basis of sovereignty in Vedic India, for instance. Of course, we no longer sacrifice our kings. We don't even decapitate them as the French did. Hell, we no longer have king kings, and we don't execute their generals. We trial them. Civilized nations we are. 
And yet, for all the differences condensed in the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Nuremberg Trials precedents, for all our differences with the ancient Indians and the Greek or the revolutionary French or the Haitians, one common theme remains. The victim must be substituted. Now, how do we substitute or let go of the missing bodies and silenced voices if they remain hidden in the records that would serve as the basis of a case of reparations? How do we make them reappear, count and matter if they didn't matter when they were alive? We might need a different mode of counting here, of number and pricing, different from the predatory logics of sovereignty, substitution and derivation depicted in Delacroix's death of Sardanapalus.